Hey everyone, welcome to our small footprint. My name is Nissa, and if you're new here, we are a family of eight who live off grid in Australia. It has been a bit of a crappy couple of days, <laughs> so I'm a bit late getting this voiceover done, but that's what happens at this point of the month as well. Uh, it is freezing for us. Uh, the inside of the house has not got an over 12 today. <laughs> um, we're not running a fire during the day due to issues with timber and the chainsaw and, and hopefully that will be corrected by the end of the week maybe early next week and we'll be able to have enough wood to be able to run it during the day as well on days like this but at the moment we just bundle up and that's fine and just run it overnight to keep the house warm of an evening but it's still down to sort of six degrees inside by the time we get up of a morning so you know it's fine we've got everyone's got uh dressing gowns and and onesies and things like that and as soon as the sun gets up then it warms up and that sort of thing but there just hasn't been much in the way of sun today at all uh so we also ran out of water this morning uh someone obviously hadn't checked the tank appropriately and there'd been questions about whether what water was left and apparently there wasn't water left so we ran out but then we had problems with fetching water and making sure that there is enough water with a with a pump on your tank you have to have the water height sort of above or at the level of the pump so that the water doesn't flow back and there's enough pressure and anyway uh this is my first coffee and it's like four o'clock in the afternoon so that has been fun so i at least i have coffee now but it uh yeah it was a long time coming so we are on to part two of all the meal prep planning preserving and stuff for the july august period so uh, that's what today's video is i just hadn't got out here to do a voiceover in amongst everything else that was going on uh, so i also have injured my shoulder so it might be noticeable in some of the videos and uh, it has limited me a little bit um, I went to the GP about it and have to go and get an ultrasound and stuff, but I can't drive myself to go and get the ultrasound, so I have to rely on friends, and it's all just a little bit hard, so we'll, we'll I might just see if it settles down anyway, and take some ibuprofen, and we'll see if it just settles down on its own. Uh, so that has been going on as well. It's been a bit of a hectic week, but, you know. So we're going to get into the food for this part two of July, August anyway. And then I have written out notes for the next couple. So hopefully I'll get some more voiceovers done tomorrow. Uh, I do have to catch up on a few things that I didn't get done today, though. I have some soup that needs canning, but I didn't have enough water to fill the canner and things like that. So I will do that tomorrow, which is fine. Stuff went in the fridge and, and that, and it's all good. Uh, but I did plan to get it done today and didn't so we will see how the next couple of days progress and Daryl's gonna have to do a few trips into town to get some more water because uh, we only get it a thousand liters at a time uh, so it uh, we need a couple of thousand to bump up that tank which we normally leave it like there's normally no less than sort of three or four thousand in the tank I'm not entirely sure what happened as to why we ran so low but we did and that happens when you're living lifestyles like we are i think we relied on too much from the rain we got all this rain but obviously we didn't get a whole lot into the tank so we'll see <laughs> uh, so let's get into it and i'll see you at the end so one of the veggies that i rely on quite heavily from the fruit and veg shop is cabbage in the new fridge that we have so it's like a chest fridge it's a large hybrid chest fridge freezer 500 liter one cabbages will last almost an entire shopping trip for me so you know at the six week mark they definitely would last the six weeks i'm not real sure about the eight to nine i suppose it depends on how much else is in the fridge and things like that and how fresh they were when we got them as well but they last a good sort of six weeks so long as you once you've cut one in half then you want to use the other half fairly quickly but that initial uh whole head cabbage lasts for like six weeks in the fridge and you lose a few of the outer leaves they get a little bit soft but once you cut them away the inside's just as crunchy as it was we did discover that that the uh, the what do they call the um, having a mind blank the more ruffled less dense heads don't last as well as like a drum head a good drum head so I do buy the drum heads if if I can because they just seem to last better so we use them for a, a range of things uh, it's a really good bulk up for stir fries or I use it in ramen and things like that especially towards the end of the month it gives you that crunchy vegetable uh, nice and fresh straight out of the fridge instead of something that's been frozen or canned or processed uh, but we love okonomiyaki which is a Japanese cabbage pancake. I do have a video, I'll try and remember to put a card in here to show this from scratch on how we make it and all the, the tips and tricks. 
but basically I get a cabbage and I slice it up really nice and fine. You can cut it however you want. I like it really nice and fine because I like that texture in the pancakes. So I tend to half it and then just slice it into really nice thin strips. We like to serve it with a variety of different things like this Japanese pancake but one thing that we do enjoy it with is my marinated chicken thighs. So I had half a pack of chicken thighs to use so I've used the other half I think that was for the lemon butter chicken so I had half a pack left uh, that was open in the fridge and needed to be used. So I sliced it up into thin strips uh, just checked for bones and gristle as normal and sliced it all up into really thin strips and then marinated it like I normally do with all my standard sort of marinade ingredients. You got some salt and some pepper, uh, smoked paprika, garlic and a bit of cowboy candy. That's sort of a flavor profile that I use on my chicken most of the time. I tend to use pretty much the same marinade, uh, base marinade on most of my chicken throughout the whole month just because that's the flavors that we like and it complements using it in other things so in other dishes that I use this marinated chicken in those flavors complement that so that's why we tend to stick to that I make up the batter for the okonomiyaki in a big bowl as I said there's a video that shows it all in depth but it's basically just the cabbage covered in a bit of flour some eggs and the eggs are variable depending on how many I have available two four six ten it really just I've done even done it with a dozen eggs when I've had a real surplus of eggs and then I mix that through the cabbage add a little bit of soy sauce water onion and then flour to get to the right texture so in the video I go into it more in depth but there's different variations of the texture of the batter that you want I like mine to be lots of cabbage with minimal batter. Some people prefer the batter to be thinner with the cabbage. It's a, it's like a fritter. So it's your choice as to how dense you like that batter with the cabbage. So I just get it to where I want it to be, mixed all up and put together, ready to go. I cooked the chicken off in the cast iron pan. And like always, I like to do this in batches so that it caramelizes and gets nice and colored on the outside of the chicken and has that sort of a, a uh, smoky flavor to it rather than sweating off in its own juices and stewing. I get, I have had a few comments recently about the food always looking burnt. And yes, we do like it to be colored like that, especially something like this. So cowboy candy is one of the marinade ingredients and it's high in sugar. So when you hit a hot pan with a high sugar product, it's going to caramelize a little bit like a toffee. It's going to go kind of sticky, kind of dark and and just have that kind of a texture so the idea here is that we're putting it in a really nice hot pan so it caramelizes on the outside and then the inside stays really nice and moist but you've got that sort of tacky sticky sweet ex exterior to it so that's why we that's how I like it that's why I do it but it does have a tendency to look a little overcooked I suppose for some people I cooked off the okonomiyaki in the pan as well. I use around about a quarter cup portions to make smaller ones or we make big ones. It really is, it depends on what how you're eating them. I do find the smaller ones easier. The kids have two or three each. Uh, it means that I'm gonna get it cooked all the way through in a quicker period of time and be more positive that it is cooked through in the middle rather than having some wet batter in the middle, which is fine. It doesn't taste bad or anything, but I prefer them to be nice and well cooked all the way through. I really like them crispy on the outside too. So I put a bit of oil in the pan because I like that outside texture to get a little bit crunchy, uh, but you don't have to, you can have them soft. It's just however you you know, want them to be. I also made some ketchup manis to have with them, which we really like. I used to buy it and I now make it because it, I can. Uh, and it's basically 50-50 soy sauce with sugar. Uh, I use raw sugar uh, and uh, you can add some spices and stuff, like some garlic and onion and, and what and ginger and that sort of thing if you want, but we just do it basic. So I do 50-50 soy sauce sugar, cook it in a little pot until it gets thicker so it reduces a little bit, gets a little bit thicker and then take it off and we just drizzle that over. Uh, the new stove has been good to have the ability to have like three pots on there so I could have the chicken going, I could be cooking the uh, okonomiyaki in batches and I can also have that ketchup manis in the back sort of simmering away. You want to put it in an oversized pan because it will bubble up and you want to keep an eye on it because as it bubbles up, I have had it overflow, it's not much fun. Uh, so you want to keep an eye on it, keep stirring it and, and watch it while you're doing it. So so having these three burners on the stove has made life a lot easier in that sense <laughs> because I used to do the ketchup minis in on the little side burner of the barbecue at a distance and that's where I've boiled it over because I've you know walked back to the camp chef to keep cooking the okonomiyaki and not even thought about the fact that the ketchup minis was still going and then yeah so anyway keep an eye on it while you're doing it 
we serve it up with mayo so typically you'd use kewpie mayo which is a Japanese mayo which is rather a savory mayo it's done with vinegar and uh, not not much in the way of added flavors to it but I just make my standard mayo because we like it uh, it's pro it's definitely a lot sweeter than a than the kewpie mayo but we're going to use it on a variety of different things so we just put it on the plate we put some chicken on top we put a little bit of mayo or from in my case which is probably my plate that we're showing i put a generous amount of mayo because i really like mayo and then we drizzle the ketchup manise over the top uh, and serve it just like that to eat and it is really really delicious one of the other things I did today, it was partly to, you know, test out the oven. We're still working on figuring out the oven. So there's some things that I'm making that I don't always make. I do enjoy making, but at the same time, I've had difficulty with using the barbecue for, so now I'm going to make them in the oven. And one of those things is chocolate chip cookies. Now, this is, I made a really standard chocolate chip cookie recipe. I used Nuddlex instead of butter uh, and that sort of thing like they're dairy free but other than that they're a very standard chocolate chip cookie which means that there's a lot of sugar in these and I understand the science behind why they need the sugar to get the texture and everything else and that's what I was going for was I was testing out the oven to make something classic something that you want to work out a certain way so I'm going to be able to judge the the way the oven works by the the way the biscuits turn out but only if those biscuits were sort of a classic sort of a biscuit uh, so I use yeah as I said it's a it's a very basic chocolate chip cookie recipe it's a no chill one and I use um, cookie scoops to put it on the trays uh, and I'm figuring out how many trays can go in the oven I'm figuring out if the temperature is an issue like if you've got trays on the bottom shelf and the top shelf does that impact the cook time do I have to rotate them I don't feel like I do because the heat in this particular oven is all the elements the the flame is all the way around the sides of the oven there's no element on the bottom it's all at the sides and the back which is kind of neat because it means that the heat is rotating through that oven quite well even without a fan even when having things stacked on top of each other I'm still you know still a work in progress but it seems to be working really well and the size of the oven means that I can fit two half sized cookie sheet sized trays per tray as well so I can fit four in the oven at any one time and there is a bit of distance that I can put between them as well so as I said I'm still working it out still figuring out the temperature the way it works and all the rest of it so I thought cookie chocolate chip cookies were a really good way to do that uh, as I said I scooped them out onto the baking trays using the uh, cookie the um, ice cream scoops so that I get them all even I probably would make them a little bit uh, smaller next time because they did crowd a little bit on these trays but uh, these were this slightly smaller than the cookie sheet tray so I'm actually looking to buy new trays because the half sheet cookie trays that I have are from Costco and they're aluminium and uh, they have warped a little bit and discolored a little bit in the hooded barbecue because you know that flame directly underneath which is to be expected and it would be less of an issue in the new oven and so I could potentially buy more of these but they don't have them at Costco all the time they're only there every now and again and they normally come in a set so you get the large ones and the small ones and I don't use the small ones anywhere near as much uh, so I think I might buy the that Thermomix has rose gold ones that are a steel um, and they have the silicon they have a set with the the extra large tray which is around about the same size as a half cookie sheet but they come in a set with a silicon liner and a rack that fits in on them as well so I'm thinking I might go that way it's going to be a little bit of an investment to buy four of them but I think it's worthwhile in the end I did have a look at the Amazon Prime sales today to see if there was anything that sort of popped out but I didn't see anything there uh, so anyway that was an awful lot of a squirrel the cookies spread a little bit when they cooked they joined together a little bit because the trays were a little bit small for the amount of cookies that I put on there because I was just being a little bit over effusive in the amount of cookies that I was putting in the tray but if I used a slightly smaller ice cream scoop then that would work too uh, so once they were cooked I let them cool for the five minutes as you need on the tray and then transferred them to a rack I have made these again recently and I cooked them longer to get them a little bit more crisp uh, this is perfect texture you can see that when you break them half they're chewy and they've got that perfect sort of a chewy chocolate chip texture uh, and they were great but how we eat them generally speaking is with coffee or something or the kids have them with tea or hot chocolate and things like that and I think the the really crunchy version of them, the slightly the cooked slightly longer version uh, is we actually like more so I might try to emulate that more or less than this more than this sort of a softer texture 
while I was cooking the cookies, like baking the cookies, getting the trays in and out, refilling them, getting them on racks and things like that, I was also making a whole bunch of ice cream flavors. I'm still really working on the flavors and the textures. We've had some that have really not spun very well and things like that. So I'm working on that before I share much in the way of that. Though I did do a short on their mint choc chip the other day because the kids have requested that like three times now. They really like it. Uh, so I've got the short of making it i just have to finish filming the spinning of it and stuff so i'll try and get that done in the next couple of days there's one in the freezer to spin and share that as a short and a recipe and stuff there too that was a custard based one it's a cooked custard base like vanilla malt vanilla mint ice cream with choc chips it's really tasty uh but i have a bunch there there's a vanilla malt there's a chocolate there's the mint choc chip um i think there's a raspberry peanut butter banana one or something like that too so we're still working on it and I'll share them as I go I'm not sure what we had for dinner that day because I don't appear to have anything anything further footage on that so maybe we had ice cream and cookies no <laughs> unlikely but uh, I'm not sure what we had for that day probably leftovers of some sort I can't remember what the previous video had for dinner maybe there was leftovers for I don't know anyway <laughs> so the next day I did a bulk batch of the English muffins and I shared the whole process of those just the other day but wanted to try them out with three pans going on the stovetop I thought that this would make it a whole lot quicker to get done and if it does then it just makes it such a more approachable thing to make uh, though the temperatures do have to be warm enough to get the dough to proof the same day to get them cooked if we're gonna be eating them for sort of a brunch sort of thing but to making them making them in bulk uh, it being able to cook them off quickly is the big thing here so it was really nice to be able to do them with the three trays and know that I could get them all done all cooked off in a decent amount of time and on a rack and done and these were we ate these for the next three days sort of thing so uh, I was happy to to give that a go and and see how that sort of ran after that I had to get rid get through the rest of the chicken so where the chickens coming up to its best before dates uh, and I keep an eye on that as I go through the freezer so that fridge so that's one of the big things about buying in bulk like this is that I have to keep an eye on and be aware of the things that need to be used up first as I discussed a few times it's, you know if there's seconds fruit and veg then they need to be used and then chicken is one of the things that needs to be sorted as well any sort of a um, meat that's half bred like the we bought the ham that had to be sliced we've been eating that for the the whole week uh because that needed to, once it was open and sliced that's it it needs to be eaten or frozen but the pork uh vacuum sealed pork roasts they're used by the best before date isn't until uh like late july i think it is and the beef is vacuum sealed and it will last for weeks months in the bottom of the fridge in the cold spot of the fridge so it can be put off as well so but chicken is one of those things that I tend to get through fairly quickly and I we eat it for the first few days however we do it and then I do something with the rest of it uh, so I cut up the thighs that I had left and I think I had five trays of four trays of chicken thighs left maybe uh, and one of the ways that we really like these to use these is as buttermilk chicken and I found that one of the ways that we regularly use those buttermilk chicken pieces is on sliders so when I was cutting up all the chicken what I did was I cut off some of the larger chunks of thigh and put them in a bowl and then I put the and then I cut the rest into strips to go into the other bowl so that I had two different sort of styled slicing of them to use uh, we don't the buttermilk chicken sometimes I just do as cubes or chunks or strips or it doesn't really matter but I just thought this particular time that I would pull out some of those nice bigger fillet style pieces to do the buttermilk on and then slice up the rest as well so I split them into bowls while I was doing them the larger pieces we went into a container covered with we use milk kefir buttermilk you just want you know a an acidic dairy product sort of thing uh, so we use milk kefir to do, to do that and then it goes in the fridge to marinate until I use it you can it can be an hour it can be overnight uh, it really is variable and just it's up to you as how long you want to leave it you can season that kefir buttermilk mix too I didn't this particular time but you can put all your garlic and salt and pepper and smoked paprika in that and I do quite often you can also turn it into a bit of a batter so instead of just putting like if you're in a bit of a rush and you don't want to marinate it you can turn that milk kefir into a bit of a batter by adding some egg and some flour and all your seasonings and stuff and making it that little bit thicker and then it's yeah it's more of a batter than a marinade but I had time to let this sit so I decided to just mix the milk kefir in there I would normally season it I totally forgot and then just let it sit until I was ready to come back to it 
The rest of the strips went into the two bowls just to make it easier to handle and I marinated them like normal. So again, I used my normal salt, pepper, garlic powder, smoked paprika, cowboy candy, sometimes some lemon juice, uh, some oil if, it, if I think it needs it. I want some good color on there from the smoked paprika. Sometimes I use some garlic or ginger in there if I am looking for an Asian tone to it. So, but the base marinade is what I tend to use and then I just massage it through so that all the pieces are nicely colored nicely covered and uh, it can go back in the fridge with the lids on to just sit or just sit on the bench for a bit with the lids on depending on the temperatures outside and things like that I put some lard in the pans. Now, I render lard regularly. You'll have seen videos on it, but I stop using it as much when it's hot because it ends up liquid, it's harder to use, and if it gets contaminated, it will go rancid. Like if someone puts a knife in there that has something else on it and it's hot, then it'll go rancid. Whereas if it's cold and solid, it doesn't because whatever that contaminant is, it just sits on the surface of the lard. It doesn't cause an issue not in the time that we use it so you want I want to keep it solid and I'd have to put it in the fridge and pull it out to do that in the heat and it doesn't always happen and then we sometimes lose a jar because it just doesn't smell great uh, so I tend to use it a lot more in the colder weather where I can scoop it out I do always have a jar in the fridge though to use for things like pastry crusts or tortillas and things like that and uh, I just put it back in the fridge but it means that no one else is using it on the pans or anything either so it's a bit more in my control uh, but in winter we tend to use lard a fair bit I love of the texture that it does when frying. So I put a bit of lard in the pan. You need a decent amount for this chicken because otherwise it will stick quite badly because of that sugar content. So I put it in the pan and then I just cooked off the chicken in batches. I got three pans going which was amazing because normally it takes me hours to sit there and cook it all off because it takes quite a while. You want the temperature hot enough to create that caramelization but not so hot that it burns before the inside's cooked especially if you're going to cook it all the way through. Sometimes I only color the outside I'm not cooking it all the way through and I'm sticking it straight in the freezer but this is going to go in the fridge which means that it'll be eaten from over the next few days so it needs to be well cooked so that nobody pulls a piece out and chews on it and it's not cooked all the way through. Uh, uh, so the three pans going, do it in batches so that it caramelizes rather than stewing and get that all cooked off. I then transferred it into some storage containers, let it cool a little before going in the fridge. As I said, we'll eat from this for, the, for a couple of days and the rest will be vacuum sealed and frozen for later on in the month. Once we eat the couple of days worth, whatever's left will be frozen. I decided to cook the buttermilk chicken up that evening. We'll have some for dinner and freeze the rest for later on in the month. So I seasoned a bunch of flour, salt, pepper, smoked paprika, a little bit of vegeta, that sort of a thing. Then while I was getting the oil to heat, I cut up a bunch of vegetables, beans, cauliflower, broccoli, whatever I had. This is what I have this particular shopping trip. Put them in a big bowl so that I can cook them off. I also diced up a whole lot of potato and got them in the steamer to be steamed for mashed potato. Uh, once the oil was hot enough I started dredging the chicken in the flour mix. Now you want to make sure that you take plenty of liquid with it because this isn't the batter version, this is just the marinade version. You want to take, make sure you take plenty of that liquid marinade with it into the flour because that's going to create your flaky pieces that's, that is the, you know, the hallmark of buttermilk chicken. Uh, so you take plenty of that kefir or buttermilk with it into the flour and then just dredge it. Uh, dredging it and cooking it in badges, batches so as not to overload the oil and drop the temperature of it because if you put too much cold chicken into the oil the temperature is going to drop and it's not going to cook properly if your oil is too cold then the uh, the batter the the uh, flour and stuff is going to suck up a whole lot of oil before it starts cooking so you need your, your oil temperature to be at a temperature that it starts cooking straight away rather than absorbing it's going to absorb a little bit because that's you know that's what fried food does but if it's too cold it'll make it sort of soggy uh, cooking it all off not so that it's not just this meal but it can be used later I don't like to if I'm going to pull a pot of oil out and fry chicken I'm going to do all the chicken not just a little bit and then come back to it uh, the veggies we just grilled off in a cast iron now I've been using my cookie sheets as a lid to sort of over the top of the pans because we want those veggies to steam slightly as they're grilling just makes it quicker uh, and I've been using it for English muffins too you would have seen that earlier on that I used it for the English muffins I have been hunting for some square lids that'll fit these pans rather than using the cookie sheets because they get hot but they're also larger than the pots so it's kind of awkward it works though and that's all I'm asking for at the moment uh, but I haven't found any so far that so there are 30 centimeter square cast iron pan these are Pyrolux brand um, and I found a couple of lids that would work one was from a wholesaler and they're only like ten dollars each but they wanted me to spend 150 dollars to order them and if they had something else there that I'd use hey I totally would have but there just wasn't much else for sale there that I wanted and 
So I don't know. I'm still looking. Uh, and then we just served it up. Veggies and potato with some ghee and salt over the top and the fresh fried chicken. I actually ate mine standing at the bench because I needed to get all that chicken done. Uh, so I served everyone else up, served mine up and, and just, just stood, stood at the bench and ate mine <laughs> while I got the rest of the chicken cooked uh, and on that tray and then let it cool a little bit and then we bag it up for the freezer. Now this one I have this chicken I have tried vacuum sealing and I don't like it. Uh, if I could flash freeze it first, like on trays, flash freeze it and then vacuum seal it, it'd work fine I reckon. Uh, but because I don't have the room to flash freeze it before I vacuum seal it, it just, it doesn't work. It uh, it all get smushed together and when I try to reheat it for, like, because all I'm going to do is put it on a rack on a tray to cook it when I want to eat it the next time, it was all stuck together and then batter broke off and it doesn't work. What works best for this I found is just Ziploc bags. And again, I'm not I'm not keeping it for extended periods of time so it's not a big deal and all I do is I mark the Ziploc bag so I have a couple of Ziploc bags that live in the freezer that have buttermilk chicken written on them so every time we're bagging buttermilk chicken I just go and grab those freezer bags that have buttermilk chicken written on them the buttermilk chicken goes in goes in the freezer and then as soon as I empty it it just goes back in the freezer and then nothing's going bad I don't have to try and wash the the vacuum the uh, Ziploc bags because it just that it just doesn't work for us in in our situation washing them doesn't work so I tend to have them assigned to certain things and I will throw them out if I've used something in them that isn't going to be safe for me to reuse it in another way uh, but things like fruit like I normally have like ones that have banana written on them and then the ones that have the buttermilk chicken what else do I do regularly in Ziploc bags and things like you know wontons or pies or anything like that that is sort of individualized anyway um, and is not going to be a long-term storage like if it's gonna if I need it to stay in the uh, freezer for too long then I want to vacuum seal it but yeah for this particular sort of thing the buttermilk chicken I much prefer it in the vacuum seal bag so it's got its own separate you know space as well uh, so that's what we did once it was cooled stuck it in Ziploc bags and got it in the freezer I think there was two more meals worth out of what I cooked so it was three meals all up dinner and then two more frozen meals for later and it does the reason I do it like this uh, and not do it in the oven is because when I reheat it because it's been deep fried there's so much oil in that uh, crumbing that when it's reheated in the oven it still ends up beautiful and crisp and just the same texture and I think that's worthwhile doing so uh, so that was the next couple of days of food prep planning preserving and stuff for July August and I hope you enjoyed watching and I hope that everyone's still finding all this sort of stuff enjoyable the, and you know some people are finding it informative and I will see you guys on the next video thanks for watching guys